Great, let's get started. Um, first of all, I would like to formally introduce myself. My name is Igor. Um, I'm a founder of Ingenious, which is the consulting company uh, with the focus on mobile first, which means mobile development, mobile task automation, mobile DevOps, all the uh, mobile end-to-end -end solutions that we offer to our customers. I'm also uh, taking a role as an engineering manager. I'm, I'm currently, I'm sorry, engineering manager at Tinder, still is actively managing release management and quality team, including task automation. Um, I have 14 years of experience in this field. I worked in a company so, such as Barnes & Noble, Expedia, consulted multiple startups, including um, stealth startups, as well as the well-known companies that used to be startups, um, consulted for Apple um, and various companies in Silicon Valley across the United States. Um, I am also the speaker at various webinars, meetups, uh, conferences. So you can definitely see my face around the community. Um, I'm a huge evangelist on testing. Um, I'm a big believer in test automation. And today I'm gonna share my experience, um, both how like was my journey uh, in test automation where I started originally from QA and transfer to test automation. So everything you see in today's presentation will be my personal experience that I would like to share with all of you so you can uh, succeed in your career. All right, here's the probably the most important slide of the entire presentation, how to make 200,000 plus per year. And I put this number for a reason. Uh, I always like the anecdotal stories. I recently talked to one of our students uh, who literally was our student of, a little bit more than a year ago, and he shared with me his success story. He just passed the interview to um, a private company and got uh, more than 200,000 per year offer as the ASDAT, Software Developer Engineering Test. Uh, to be more specific, the role he took was as the Android ASDAT. And uh, I talked to a lot of uh, students, colleagues, and tried to probe the market. Obviously, what do you see on the screen? This number is pertained to the Silicon Valley, uh, obviously high standard of living, but because of the COVID and the remote jobs, the whole thing is actually uh, you know, transfer right now across the United States. Yes, realistically, you can make such money as the task automation engineer. So everything I'm gonna give you today's advice will lead you towards that compensation. I think we don't have to lie to each other Compensation is the huge part of uh, you know our uh, profession, our career, and uh, we're not going to lie to each other. That's the main point. We would like to excel in our career from manual testing. So, because this webinar specifically targets the manual testers, I would like to be uh, you know more specific and give you recipes on how to transfer from manual testing to set as automation. This is not the webinar when I'm gonna focus for the rookies who are just starting in testing world. So my entire presentation will be focused on that. Yes, somebody wrote 200K is unbelievable. Indeed, it is unbelievable. So before, let me go back to the previous slide. One second. Yes, you have to, you have to become a solid manual tester with at least one year plus experience before you start considering test automation. So if you just started the you know, uh, quality assurance role at your company, my recommendation that stay there at least for one year, and we're gonna talk about what are the prerequisites before you even start considering test automation, because a lot of people start thinking about test automation like from day one, but in reality, uh, you're not supposed to think about that. You have to become a really good manual tester beforehand. So what is a solid manual uh, quality assurance engineer? So in my perception and based on my experience, you have to have a lot of different skills uh, in order to consider yourself as the seasonal good manual tester. So obviously you have to understand about the requirements, design, uh, you know, um, also the planning phase, 
So you have to be able to collaborate with uh, a lot of team members uh, in your company, such as uh, UX designers, such as the product managers, project managers. You have to together work on a, a legit uh, you know, test cases and have a comprehensive test plans. So you have to be able to create a solid strategies around uh, testing uh, before even it starts. Another big thing is called testing cycles, right? Uh, I know a lot of you probably doing the regression testing, some sort of testing, ad hoc testing, but in reality, the testing starts before actual testing activity is starting, such is in development cycles, right? For instance, you work with developers on their user stories, on their bug fixes, and make sure you test uh, before regression cycle. Obviously, once you finish this uh, one week or two week sprints, then you go on a regression cycle with the rest of the team, you know, and test the entire application. Then you go to release phase. And then once you're in the release phase, you are uh, make sure that you go through the checklist, make sure you're, you know, uh, covering things such as the string translations, uh, localization, a lot of different things. And obviously, once you roll out to production, then you validate that everything you actually testing on a test environments uh, and pre-production environments actually valid on production. So you have to uh, you have to navigate yourself through different testing cycles and being comfortable with this. Another big thing is obviously test execution. You have to be a really good tester. You have to know your way around to find the bugs. And uh, for instance, uh, bug reports are very important. If you uh, cannot create the uh, comprehensive bugs that are very easy to uh, understand, understood by the developers and product, then it's going to be an issue. So you have to be very diligent. You have to attach logs. Uh, you have to uh, also organize bug bashes, make sure that you, know, you just yourself on the team or maybe a few of you, then you bring uh, entire engineering team um, into, the, uh, into the play and do bug bashes before releases. Bug triage process is also you have to run all the bug triage process with the product and project management to make sure you prioritize bugs, bugs based on the uh, business priorities. So everything I listed here, I consider a must have before I even start considering automation. You have to be comfortable in all these aspects of the quality assurance uh, beforehand. Um, so there's different types of testing we have to understand that you have to be comfortable with, which is functional testing, very common one, right? You are basically trying to test the functionality of either web application uh, or a mobile application. UI testing, make sure that UI is actually correspond to the original UX and UI design specs. Exploratory testing, that's where you actually find the majority of defects when exploring the features and actually uh, wearing the head of the end users. Analytics testing is the huge one. I think this is the number one issue that costs millions and sometimes billions of dollars missed by the company because the analytics are not tested. For instance, uh, you're testing application that reports profits, right, from the purchases. Let's say it's e-commerce app. And then all of a sudden, uh, the information is not tracked properly. So you can easily inflate these numbers and uh, without knowing about this. From functional aspect, application works fine, but from analytics could be broken. So that type of testing, very important nowadays. Localization, your application might, might could be used in multiple locales across the globe. So um, think about this, right? Uh, you have to find a way to test it, uh, you know, how the application function with different languages. You might not be the linguist, but at least you can see strings that are not translated, shifted UIs and the box pertain to the UI changes due to the localization issues. Accessibility, a very big one in the United States. A lot of company get sued for accessibility issues. For instance, vision impaired people have to also be able to use the application you're testing. There's various techniques on that. API testing, probably very most important. You cannot test the client without testing APIs because if you test end to end, you never know what's the back end or the front end failing. So sometimes you have to investigate if the API is actually up to the spec. Is it working as intended? So all of these activities I actually listed here, it's all considered part of the manual testing arsenal. And this is so important to have all this in your arsenal. Otherwise, you're not going to be a full 
um, you know, trained manual tester. Tools, you have to be comfortable with the tools such as Jira, right, for all the uh, activities, uh, project activities, including the specs, you know, user stories, epics. Uh, uh, some people even use Jira plugins for test case writing. Definitely number one place for the bug reports. Test trail, this is your test case repository. There's a Zephyr, which is alternative to test trail. There's way more different test case repositories could be used. You have to be comfortable to create it. Why tools like such as test trail is important to know as a manual tester is because it has historical things, right? It stores the report per release. You can see how many test cases you write per release. Uh, you can see the metrics such as the increase, decrease in number of coverage, uh, pass or fail rate over a period of time. So it has a great, great reporting capabilities, which I think very important for project management. Charles, proxy tool like Charles or Wireshark is very important nowadays because you have to spool the traffic to find and test analytics perhaps, but there's other things you can use Charles for. Chrome DevTools, doesn't need advertising. If you're on web testing, this is must to know tool. Postman, probably the number one used for the API testing for many old testers. Uh, storing collections. There's alternative to Postman, but Postman is free of charge. They do have paid version, but I think you must know Postman. Android Studio Xcode, if you're in mobile testing, I must to know. And I think you have to be able to navigate around those uh, IDs, environments, you know, and be comfortable to use their testing tools. Like for instance, Android Studio have logging mechanism. You can actually slow down the traffic. You can do a lot of different things exploring the internals of device, including its, uh, you know, uh, Linux shell, uh, Xcode same way. So everything you see here for the previous uh, few slides is, in my perception, must know by manual tester. To master all everything, including the methodologies, including the tooling, um, it takes about a year in my perception, but not just a year of no speaking, but one year of a full dedicated productive work. And this is the, what I call prerequisites before you even start considering test automation. So if you feel like after my presentation right now that all of a sudden you don't know any of these things or some of the things, I really encourage you to start learning them on your manual testing and put in your you know, arsenal of tools and techniques uh, before you even start considering test automation. So hypothetically, one year passed by, then what? So yes, you spend the entire year of your career to improve everything I was mentioning in the previous slides. Then you said, okay, I am ready to make my next step. I'm ready to go for the test automation journey. Okay, and that's what I think this is the checkbox when people feel like, okay, I've done everything I could. I consider myself a really good manual tester with, you know, all these great experiences. And uh, what's next? Because this uh, webinar, again, I'm going to reiterate on the topic. So we're all on the same page is how to become test automation engineer, what we call uh, AKA you know, as that, right? Software developer, engineering test. And I use these terms interchangeably because a lot of people try to use them as synonyms. Although like for instance, a company as a Google distinguish them as the roles. However, in the industry, sometimes they are meaning the same thing. But anyway, coming back to original point, you are busy. You work day and night. You are part of the regression cycles, in-depth cycles, you are basically don't have time. You burned out after work. You want to spend time with your families, with your bodies, go to the gym. You know, it's really, really hard to make a shift in your career, especially in test automation, because it's very engineering centric role. It is extremely hard to move, you know, during a busy schedule. And from now on until the end of my presentation, I'm gonna share with my personal experiences. Uh, that was my road and not only my road, the way I actually taught a lot of people how to get successfully from manual testing uh, to the automation, test automation role. How transit, you know, to a such technical uh, position while being extremely busy, all right? 
Let's go. I'm excited. Number one is obviously you have to pick your domain. So you're going to say, Igor, what do you mean? Like uh, you cannot be good at multiple things. So you have to understand you have to be either IES, Android, web, or backend automation engineer. You cannot be all of them, period. You have to understand that by now, you have to realize what technology you like the most and make your decision. For instance, I started my career in automation as a web because it was 2011. Web automation was thriving. Simon Stewart, Google released uh, Selenium WebDriver 2.0. So web automation was no brainer. Okay, But it doesn't matter. You have to pick one. Um, another big thing, you have to build a portfolio. So another thing is you cannot learn test automation. We're going to talk more in other slides in details about this. You have to have a test project, right? You cannot learn automation uh, just on a tutorial. You have to actually build the case for this. And like I said, we're going to talk more about this. Obviously, you have to create your LinkedIn and updated resume with that skill so you can advertise yourself on the market and start attending conferences because the conferences, meetups, are the huge networking event we're going to get the next job. It's really, really hard to get a job just by searching it. It's much easier to get it by communicating in community and exchanging your ideas. Obviously, another big way to jump in the, in the career ladder is to ask for promotion with the company. We're going to talk more about this. And obviously, there's an interview process. So again, we're going to talk about all these bullet points in detail in next slides. So let's roll on. Pick your domain. You have to understand that you only can be good at one thing, period. Like I said, have you ever seen an iOS developer that also does Android or vice versa? Have you ever seen the web developer who actually writes on, let's say, React or Angular and also do iOS development? Have you ever seen a backend engineer who is actually fully dedicated, good backend engineer that also doing the IES development? And the answer is no. Test automation is no exception. You can be good only in one thing. Of course, after two, three years being good in one thing, you can ship to another thing. So for instance, you can pick the main web automation, learn Cypress, learn WebDriver, uh, and then shift uh, you know, to the IES development. Same thing for the IES. You can be good at XUA test for two, three years and then move to the Android Espresso. So here I listed all the very common test automation framework. There are more, but I'm saying very common ones. And there is a reason for this. So for instance, let's focus on the web. Uh, the two very common ones is the web driver, which has dozens of different wrappers around it, like WebDriver.io, for instance, is a very famous one. I know Ruby, Python has different wrappers, like a libraries, but under hood is just a web driver. Currently, it's 4.0, uh, I believe, the new version of WebDriver. Cypress, in my perception, is a killer for WebDriver. This framework was really uh, adapted by the developer development community, especially React.js community. Cypress is a big thing. If you're in the web automation world, you can pick that, uh, and you're going to get a huge support from developers. Oh, uh, yes. I mean, um, there is Apium and XUA test, but Apium use XUA test on the hood as a web driver. Obviously, I prefer more native solutions. However, you can choose whatever you like. The most important thing, remember, you have to be good at one thing. So Android has Espresso and UI Automator. I think uh, nowadays Espresso name a little bit diluted. Right now it's called uh, Jetpack, I believe, test library. So it's actually umbrella for all the testing libraries, including Espresso. Again, it's 100% native, everything reading Android Studio. Backend is very interesting because backend all depends on the technology stack. It could be Python, or it could be the Node.js, it could be uh, Java stack. Regardless, API testing is actually a completely different world. It's one of my favorite. It's probably the most easiest to support but really hard to comprehend. So basically the learning curve is steeper, but the support is easier. So, but anyway, I, backend is a great way also to, uh, to jump into the career. Really recommend to look at that as well. All right, 
the secret recipe for the success is actually Aristotle's quote. For the things we have to learn before we can do them, we learn by doing them. This is the golden quote that I decided to share with you because a lot of you always thinking of learning something like, oh, I need to learn programming language. I need to like start automation. I don't have time. This is what Aristotle said. And that's what I believe worked for me. And that's what I'm going to believe worked for you. Why? Because unless you start doing this, there is no magic. You, you can take gazillion courses on Udemy, nothing ever going to happen. You have to start doing this. So the most important aspect of start doing this, remember, I'm actually reiterating on my previous slide, you have to pick a real project, right? So what was for me, it doesn't mean they have to be for you, I picked the project at my work. Uh, here's the anecdote. I was working at Barnes & Noble as the manual tester, 2010. Um, I decided to learn automation. So I came to my boss and say, John, I would like to actually work on a web reader and I know how to automate it. 2011 WebDriver 2.0 was released. I said, oh, let me try that. I used Java, testing G, um, WebDriver, and uh, used a couple of Windows boxes and start automating a uh, web reader for the Barnes & Noble product. It took me like two, three months to figure out. There was no tutorials back then, but I did the ugly job, but it worked. It actually did work because I tried to uh, you know, do it step by step. And uh, because uh, it was a real project, a real work, I can actually show my results and I get a, you know, praised by what I was doing. So I learned tons by that. And it was a huge bridge to move to the next job. So there is a very important point I made in this slide, right? You can always try the existing job is because that's the easy way to entry. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. You just, if you're doing the web testing or mobile testing, just pick the application, start doing that. Nobody will punish you for this, right? So nobody can stop you. And another thing, don't be afraid. A lot of people say, oh, what if I do that? What I'm going to fail? I'm going to look. Honestly, nobody cares. It's your own thing. You don't need to have tell anybody. Just start doing an initiative, you know, as a proactive move. You can automate your existing pain points. That's the big, that's a big thing. For instance, in Expedia, I start my automation by automating deep links. Yes. And trust me, the tests were ugly. I still recall those tests for the deep links. Uh, it did not use the do not repeat your concept. It was so much repetitive code. It was ugly. But guess what? They worked. Testing deep links manually is actually a nightmare. And after at Expedia in 2012, it was my second big automation job, I automated all the deep links Expedia offered for the mobile. It was more than 150 of them. So I just saved myself lots of manual testing. But the tests were ugly. I improved them over a period of the year. But I started, but because I need it. So always start to automate something you need the most. Um, Deep linking was a great example. You can do whatever. You can do login process, maybe user creation process. All depends. But start with something you need immediately. Do not learn the entire programming language first. A lot of people, I hear this all the time. Igor, I need to learn programming language. Otherwise, I'm not going to go to automation. Wrong. You can learn fundamentals, basics of that but you didn't have to learn entire language to get started. It's a big misconception. You can always ask for help. Remember, you're not alone. You can always ask developers. Developers know how to write code better than you are. And there have been instances where, for instance, I was automating the backend APIs for Expedia and I had a couple of different endpoints. And I did it, like I said, I did it in a very ugly way. I came to developers and listen, I think I'm doing something wrong. And he said, Igor, you have to use a factory pattern. It's like, what is a factory pattern? He took a marker, went to whiteboard, showed to me. I went to read the article. One day later, I implemented it and saved a lot of code. I mean, I just deleted so many repetitive lines of code by using the factory pattern. Um, you can always, like I said, you can always have fine alliance uh, in the company. That's why the best thing to start automation, if you have a job, and again, this is the 
uh, webinar for the testers who already have a work, who already working in the companies, this is a great thing. Um, it's very easy to get promoted. People get noticed because you start asking people around, you start to showcases to your leadership team, developers, you get noticed. People will say, oh, you were doing a lot of automation thing. And that's what happened to me. They approach you and ask you for a new role. So without even explicitly asking for promotion, you will get noticed, right? And obviously you're going to get realistic resume, LinkedIn skills that you can put in your arsenal. Like, like look at this, I've done this. Now a lot of companies are going to want you, right? Uh, I noticed people start asking questions in chat. Please uh, move your questions in Q&A. Uh, there's a Q&A session, I think. Um, uh, maybe it's used interchangeably. Um, I'm not aware, but uh, regardless, uh, I'll answer them. Yeah, please um, post your questions in the Q&A and chat. I'll try to read both of them, whatever you feel comfortable, but Q&A is better. Thank you. I will answer right at the end of the presentation. All right, what if you don't have a job right now? Let's say you in between the jobs. What if uh, you decided to leave the company and you don't have anything to train on? I mean, that's probably the only case I can see right now. External project is another good case. So uh, I broke down, again, everything you see in this presentation, I will, and don't get me wrong, I will share with you. Uh, and I'm going to... Uh, uh, one of my assistants, she will send um, the uh, slides and the video to your emails uh, right after this uh, webinar. Like I said, the latest probably tomorrow, but we'll try to do it today. Um, external projects. For if, again, remember, you have to pick up one domain, just very important thing. Let's say if you decided to pick IES as your domain, like, you know, automate the iPhone apps, iPad apps. By the way, the same framework worked for Mac OS X. It also worked for the um, uh, Apple Watch uh, and Apple TV. So the whole uh, XUA test stack works perfectly fine for the entire Apple stack. So again, if you decided to go to stack, we will remember one of the perks uh, for joining this webinar. I, we have 39 participants and we have, we have more than like 150 registered uh, you know, uh, people. So you're all gonna get a free introductory order me uh, application with the automated test video tutorials. You're gonna get links for that. Uh, in the YouTube, each YouTube video description will be the branch pertaining to the video. So you'll have a code, you will have the application. That's a gift from me to you to actually start, start learning the uh, yes or you know uh, test automation with XUI test, the native the most comprehensive way to learn that. So yes, you're gonna get a free um, intro course for XUA test. Order Me is an amazing application to try on. You will have a source code for that. I think it's a great way to learn if you're not uh, uh, currently employed. Espresso has amazing testing samples uh, from Google uh, for the various conditions using various Espresso features. Uh, I also attach link here. It's all clickable links. Like I said, you will get the presentation. For the web, I like probably my most favorite is from uh, uh, the, the internet project. Um, uh, Mr. Hafner wrote that long time ago. I still like it the most because it exercises uh, a lot of aspects of web driver. It's a little bit outdated, but I think still the best because you can try a lot of things here. Amazing resource for web automation, either using web driver or Cypress. Regardless, amazing, uh, you know, uh, website for exercising various capabilities of web driver. For the REST API, my recommendation to start working with a Slack API, amazing documentation, a great experience, as well as maybe Facebook Graph API. They all free. You can uh, easily get them. Um, and I even post here a project uh, from Graph who actually automated, um, uh, and this project actually has the solution for to automate the Slack API, amazing resource. Another, if you like, don't like what I'm showing to you, and again, this is my gift to you guys, I'm just sharing my experiences so you can start your journey. 
My recommendation, there's also Test Automation University by Apple Tools, amazing resource for learning. There's a lot of testing apps you can use beyond what they teach. You just can take it as a base and keep developing skills on it. So again, if you're not currently employed, if you cannot try automation at your current project, at your company, you can use the external project. And this is the resources I'm sharing. All right. Here's another big thing, chicken or an egg problem. So there's always a problem like what I should do first. A lot of people say, should I learn programming first? Should I learn, you know, the uh, platform under development first? And the answer is you have to make sure that you start with what's important right now, right? I'm not sure what is your skill level of uh, coding, but what I'm going to do right now I made an example on uh, IAS development stack, so it's just easier. But what I'm going to say right now will equally apply for all other stacks, such as web stack, uh, Android stack, and the backend stack. So again, from now on, uh, I'm going to actually make example on the IAS. It's just easier, right? So number one, please, again, I'm going to repeat myself and then again, do not try to learn the entire programming language because it's going to take you ages. People go for a four-year school for that. You know, there's no reason for that. For test automation, just to start, remember, the most important thing you have to start doing, not learning, doing by hands. I tried myself at work. Take one, two weeks max. And for instance, for Swift, right? Swift is a programming language used for the IS development nowadays. It's the uh, uh, language after the Objective-C, but Swift is what used today, right? I actually did myself. There's a link here on the slides. You can see Swift for Beginners. You can click on it and go to YouTube videos completely free by Chris. I think Chris is an amazing scholar. It's like a thing like, you know, 20 max, you know, short videos, which was going to take, even during the busy schedule, going to take you like maximum two weeks maximum just spend like literally 30 minutes to one hour a day you will be good to go with enough to get started automation can you imagine this one two weeks not one two month next a lot of people do a mistake they start after the long programming language they go and jump on a like um, testing framework such as xui test huge mistake never do that always try to learn a little bit of development why think about this is like Okay, uh, I learn English grammar. I learn first English alphabet, and I'm ready to write an essay, right? And guess what? How good your essay is going to be, right? But where are you going to write an essay, right? Hmm. I'm going to use actually. I'm going to write it by hand using my pen. Is it the most effective way? Probably not. You probably first have to learn how to use Microsoft Word or Google Docs. Right, why? Because it has a lot of great features. They can auto correct you. You can use actually Grammarly app integrated to Google Docs to give you a better correction. So obviously you have to be equipped with the tooling before, before you jump into automation. And this is the mistake number one. A lot of people who try to learn this automation, they learn programming language for three, six months, they give up and never do it. Or you learn programming language and right away start using like, web driver for web optimization or XUA test right away for, the, uh, for automating things. But the problem is very shortly, like probably within a few weeks, you're going to run to the issues that you won't be able to resolve because I think, and this is my own perception, you have to learn basics of IES development if you want to do the same thing for Android, same thing for web. You need to learn fundamentals and please do that. Again, you can take a, a Udemy course, Coursera course, build a basic app, like for instance, weather app or a to-do list app. Why? Because you're going to learn environment. You're going to learn Xcode, how to navigate around this. You're going to learn a basic foundation of like model view presenter model, what it means, how, the, how actually the nuts and ropes of the platform are working. It's going to be so important and will help you tons in automation. And again, it's going to take you another, I would say, month. So two weeks for basics of the language, one month to build the application. You, it's a prerequisite. You will be perfectly equipped for the test automation after that.
Okay. Next, start automation with XUA test. Um, so let's say you finished two weeks of the introductory course in Swift, you know, hands-on, you've done it, everything. You finished the basic application. Now you understand how to navigate in Xcode, how to actually write the basic app. What's next? For the XUA test, uh, you have, again, remember project, going back to projects, you have a project, um, you are have this application under test, you have a source code for that, you're creating test target for x test, what's next? Please do not try to write gazillion of tests. People just go like, okay, I'm a cool, I know everything, let me do like 50 tests. No, start with a two, three tests, right? Pick up the, again, if you're working on an existing project with your company, Pick up the most important things that will help you right away. Two, three tests the most. Write them in the most ugly way. Look at them, run them, and then refactor them. Start using architecture such as the page object model or if it's a mobile app screen object model. Start improving them. Then like you realize that because your tests run end-to-end, -end, they're very fragile because, for instance, the backend under deployment changes frequently, kills your test then you, okay, I need to make it my test table. Let's look at network marking or we call stubbing. Let's cut my test from the back end. Boom, you're improving this two, three test next level. Then you're like, okay, I need to decrease execution time. Let me introduce parallelization. You had another two tests and actually parallelize them. By the way, here we have a, a great a link to the uh, SIFT is actually open source library that Ingenious team is supporting completely free. It's open source for test parallelization for the IES. You can use that for that. So again, you try to improve on two, three tests until they're perfect. Uh, they're perfect from the architecture point of view, they're perfect from the execution point of view. That's exactly what, I, what you want to do, right? Next, you will, trust me, you will work with developers because uh, uh, for native frameworks such as XUAT as Espresso, the tests are written in the same GitHub or same repository as the uh, code, the code of application. So it means that you will have to submit work with a pull request. So you have to master Git and GitHub and make sure you know how to create pull requests, how to make commits, how to go through code review process, understand Git flow or trunk-based development. You have to be part of development team. You have to be integral, integrated part of the development team. So that means you won't be able to survive a single day to work without the skills. You must, you must uh, conquer the skills. And next, obviously, your test only developed locally. Then you moved into GitHub. Now they have to run in CI. Next thing you want to learn is Jenkins, right? Or Bitrise or Circle CI doesn't matter what CI system your test cannot run locally. Why? Because the more than you're going to write this test, and you want to make sure the test runs and stops someone. So, for instance, on each pull request, post merge every time PR get merged from the developers and application, the test is supposed to be triggered. Pre merge PR open commits your test trigger every commit and pull request. Basically, it's called pre-merge testing before the PR gets merged, get merged to the main branch. Test reports. In CI, you get historical test reports. You can see test coverage and the stability over a period of time. So this is, your, again, I'm showing you examples on the XUA test for the IES, but the same concept works for all the different stacks. And this is the way you want to go learning that, right? I'm going to give you like one, two, three, four, five. You have to follow the same order. Very important. Let's say hypothetically you spend three, four months, you are getting the place, you automated like a couple dozen test cases, you learn everything listed here. Then you have to create your resume and LinkedIn to actually advertise yourself on the open market. How to do that? Very easy. You have to write about your accomplishments. A lot of people write things in resume like what they've been doing. This is wrong. Again, as a gift from me to you, I'm actually put an article link here, how to write effective resumes. The formula is very simple, is accomplished X as a measured by Y by doing Z. Let me give you an example, right there on the slide. Decrease test maintainability from 80% to 20% by introducing page object model architecture and fully stopping network response. That's the bullet point of your resume. This is accomplishment. 
And that's, again, there's a full article. I'm not going to read details on the, how to write effective resumes. Your LinkedIn should reflect a resume. They, they are supposed to be identical, but they're not supposed to be like this. Automated IS application using x ray test. Wrong. Don't do that. Please use accomplishments. Again, read this article. Great resource. And again, everything you've done on your internal project or external project, make sure everything is in your resume. Very important because uh, recruiters are looking into this and you will stand out. You know how many weak LinkedIn accounts are there? Every other one is pretty bad. Just stand out. Be the best. How to get a first job? A lot of people ask me all the time, like, okay, I learned this. How do I move from manual testing to automation job? So the most important thing you have to understand, if you already work in the company, apply within the company. Promote yourself the best way. Easy. And a lot of people will be on your side. Developers that work with you together can, could be your ref references. Attend local meetups. Network is a very important thing. Conferences, meetups, always go there. I know COVID is almost over, so there are new conferences that start already operating. Please attend, attend them. The best place to network, you'll get a lot of offers. Start a YouTube channel. Yes, you hear it right. YouTube channel is very important. You have to start doing like your thing contribution to the community. Why it's important? Once you start like an automating journey, you want to share your experiences. Shoot videos around this, you know, share your experiences, how to automate certain things, how you fix certain issues with automation. And you, you don't have to like go like hour long videos, you go like five minutes videos every week. And guess what? You will get noticed. People actually lo look through YouTube for people in the industry. Then you can put this YouTube channel on top of resume or LinkedIn as a link. GitHub projects, the one I talk about external projects, if you work on external projects, it will be in the GitHub repository. Create your own, or your own GitHub account, submit your project, and guess what? It will be also on LinkedIn. It's a huge plus. So instead of you look for the job, job will look for you. People will find you. And like I said, make your LinkedIn uh, look attractive. It has to be like, I look at the LinkedIn, I want to hire right now on the spot. That's how it's supposed to be. GitHub link, YouTube link to your channel, um, accomplishments, you will stand out. Uh, trust me, I tried so many times with myself, with um, a lot of, uh, you know, uh, students we taught, works like a TikTok. Conference to the tunnel. I actually post two of my favorite ones. I actually go both of them. One is a SouthCon, usually in Austin, Texas, but they shift this year in April. Again, if you cannot attend, watch their videos. Amazing conference. Test Guild, this is the 100% virtual conference. Again, this is the links. There are the links here. You can click on them. Uh, once you receive this uh, deck, you can actually uh, go and register amazing conferences for test optimization, networking, and resources. There are more than two. I just to put my personal selection. So next question, the uh, interview for test optimization engineer. It's a huge topic. Um, this is a promo slide. Again, the next step, I mean, it's we have only one hour and I think we're already running a little bit late because I started late. Again, my apology for that. Uh, next month, May 11, 9 a.m. PST, we're going to have a webinar on the interview process for specifically for automation engineer. This is going to be an amazing webinar because I'm going to share tricks and tips how to pass the interview. I'm going to share examples of coding challenges. I'm going to share the journey that our students, myself and colleagues, even my, I mean, even me, I actually recently went to, you know, recently went through interview. We're going to share all of this interesting expertise on how, how you can pass interview, you know, as the, for the test automation engineer. A lot of our students post me, you know, personally send me emails with their experiences. So I'll share with you and I'm going to give you trip, you know, tricks and tips how to pass the interview, how to make it successful. So please register for that webinar. You will receive the link. Uh, and this is also actually right here, a link itself, the whole slide. You can click on it and register. Um, it will be an amazing webinar. 
And uh, another announcement, uh, we actually, in, co in uh, cooperation, actually in partnership with the Headspin, uh, Headspin is the cloud, uh, device cloud company as a SaaS solution. They, uh, in, in conjunction with them, we develop a super comprehensive, probably, I would say the best in the market, X-ray test course for automation engineers. It's very comprehensive. It covers topics that nobody wants to cover. Uh, very hard topics such as network stubbing, uh, architecture, uh, CI, CD, how like, you know, how to make your test bulletproof. Very, very, like, again, the, probably the most comprehensive course uh, I've seen on the market. Uh, me and my business partner personally spent a year to build this course, one year to actually make this course live. It's, uh, 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 there is a link here for Headspin University. However, uh, we are waiting for them to publish the course. It should be ready in a week. And uh, I'll share to all of you emails what is live. But uh, I would like to share this great news. It's super cheap. I think they have two, like one course would be like for 20 bucks uh, for self-taught. And then for a course that you would like to actually get hand-holding, a uh, dedicated Slack channel, a person who will walk you through like, you know, solutions. It has actually um, certification where you have to do hands-on exercises, I think that course will be $500. So again, it will be like two courses. I'm not sure which version they will release first, but I think amazing resource if you would like to actually learn IES Optimation with actually a test. It's coming soon. We'll keep you posted. Q&A session. So there's a couple of questions here. Uh, I'm going to go one by one, try to answer quickly because we're running out of time. So first question, um, Please give a hint, what is easier, Selenium or Cypress? Um, so uh, the answer right away, none of them are easy. I mean, there is nothing easy in this world. Uh, I think uh, both of them are have different purposes. So Cypress is more native solution. It actually doesn't work like a Selenium web driver. It doesn't use the over HTTP protocol to communicate to browsers. It's more native, therefore it's faster. However, you have to be somewhat a JavaScript engineer, JavaScript developer. So either TypeScript, my preference TypeScript over JavaScript. Library itself is not hard, but again, I think you have to, like I said earlier in the slides, learn uh, uh, React Native a little bit just to understand how the components are working, UI components. Uh, Cypress is very powerful. It has built-in capabilities such as network stabbing into that. You can actually automate even APIs using the Cypress. So I personally like Cypress because I'm more engineer on the engineering side. Uh, however, Selenium Web Driver is also a great choice. Remember, Cypress is limited on support. So I think like the best it works with the Chrome uh, browser. However, however uh, a couple of years they start supporting more browsers. I'm not sure how they do, like in terms of like you know stability. Uh, they have own cloud for running tests. I mean, I would say to make tests resilient both of them hard just to get started probably web driver is easier because you can choose whatever language you want you can use you know ruby python java javascript with the cypress it's only js stack uh, so the answer to your question maybe uh, if you are if you if we rephrase the question what's easier but probably would say what is more in demand what is more in fashion cypress probably more in fashion right now so I'll definitely choose Cypress. Plus, JavaScript is very easy to learn as a language. Um, one, okay, one more. Give some advice on how to start the CI in GitHub. Thanks. So yeah, GitHub already have a CI. Um, um, there, I mean, there's a bunch of tutorials out there. Um, I think that uh, the best way, like I said, just start doing this. Find tutorials how to. Uh, build your test and running in the CI. Uh, honestly, I haven't used uh, GitHub for the CI purposes. Um, I know people using more for like unit testing. For UI testing, I will probably play with Jenkins because Jenkins is free. It's open source. Uh, you can install on your computer. You can run on your computer. You can actually, um, you know, uh, play with it. In the course that I advertised on the previous slide, we have a full... Uh, uh, full uh, lesson dedicated for the Jenkins and the full section, it will be section seven, 
and that is full dedicated how to prepare for the CI. Um, but it's all on Jenkins. However, um, I think there's a bunch of tutorials on uh, uh, GitHub CI. Uh, we have already an automation team. Is it a good idea to read their automated tests, learn from that? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I think this is amazing. I mean, the best way to learn it by somebody else code. Um, and like I said, if you're in a company, if you are existing uh, resource, like an employee of that company or contractor, uh, nobody will slap your hands if you go to GitHub repository, uh, clone it and start writing tests locally. You don't have to commit tests. So then they don't, you, you don't even have to tell them the automation team, just start doing this. And you can even ask one of the automation engineers to pair up with you to help you out like on basics. But again, don't even look at the test, start fixing them, start adding new tests. And again, uh, this is the best way to learn. So please, a lot of people also like, oh, should I start? Do it, don't even ask, just do it. Ask that for a big corporation versus a startup. Um, live work balance and salary expectation between both for the entry level as that. Uh, so really good, really good question. Um, so big corporation is easier because they usually already have existing assets on the team. So you can, uh, like a previous question was asked, like what if there's existing team? It's easier to jump. Uh, so on entry level, it's better. But if you're a good automation engineer, if you're like senior level or mid-level, startup is better because you can build your own way. And usually by working two years in the company, we'll see a lot of bad code, a lot of bad tests. You're probably going to have ideas how to make it better. So that's a good time to go a startup or a tier two, tier three company, like, you know, something less, you know, fancy and implement your vision. So entry level, enterprise better. Uh, if you're more experienced, you'll get more salary, probably with more appreciation and more career growth to go a smaller company because you will be very transparent. Salary expectation varies because on the market, but you've seen it. Um, recently, I spoke to three of our former students. I think uh, the lowest salary I've seen is 160K right now for us that. That's the lowest in Silicon Valley. I haven't seen less than that. Uh, usually around 200K. My probably best, I remember Netflix. Netflix for the senior as that they paid 300. It was 2016, 2017. They probably pay more right now. 300K. All right. Mocking stopping versus real data. When should we apply it and when not in UI tests? Uh, also, what environment? Thank you. Really good question. It all depends. Uh, but again, this is not my thing. It's an industry standard for UI functional tests, for UI functional tests. It's better to mock everything. If it's a web, you can use uh, what we call uh, mock servers. It's basically a server that doesn't have any logic, just have a bunch of fakes. Uh, why the tests become extremely fast? Think about this, this fake data, you also have to configure that. So you have to like, for instance, create different names, age, different population of various uh, stages of testing, what we call uh, test setup, right? Um, so you have to have like smart way to do that, but you're gonna get super stable test. Remember, for clients such as web, iOS, and Android, you are testing clients. You don't test backend. That's why you have to uh, make sure you comply the test pyramid and uh, test backend uh, in isolation from the front end. Because when you're testing end to end, when the automated tests go like you know all the way through, if test fails, it's going to take you some time to understand why it's failing. When it's UI only, then you know it's 100% UI. This is your client. This is not the backend. So yes, please uh, use mocks uh, as much as you can. Uh, there are differences when we don't use mocks. For instance, we uh, ingenious company is automating the VPN clients because VPN is very easy on UI, but everything on the back. So VPN is a good example. You don't want to do mocking. But if it's an ordinary application, uh, such as any like Amazon, right, for instance, you, you, you would probably want to do mocking on an app and test everything else from the back end. 
Are there any books you recommend on XUI Test Espresso? No. Books get outdated super quickly. By the time they get published, they're already old. So my recommendation um, uh, to use the uh, Test Automation University I offer, it has a good beginner courses for both Espresso and XUI Test. And the uh, course that we are publishing are uh, super comprehensive. It covers all aspects of automation for XUI Test. Recommend more hands-on courses where I have to do things by hand rather than reading theory. Again, in this industry, in this profession, please do not try to be more th theoretical. Try to be more practical. And that's the road for the success. Um, yes, the question is, uh, was Igor, the course uh, you will be sharing with us uh, uh, for free, would it be the same headspin course? Uh, yes uh, and no. Uh, the, uh, you see, a lot of people, my, again, this is my personal vision and my recommendation. Don't try to do everything like right away. Try it out. See if it's something you like. And the best to try out is just by doing. Remember, coming back to Aristotle, you have to learn by doing, right? You have to learn by hands. So that's why we give a, a free, I think it's like free five module, no, free five or six lessons, I don't remember, which are enough to taste what it means the x ray test automation, which also part of that, you know, paid course. So try it out first. Uh, see if you if it's something you want to continue. And then if you like it, go ahead on a head spin and buy the full course. Um, I don't want you to spend money. I mean, this is very cheap. We used to charge like a couple of thousand dollars when we were teaching this in classroom. This is extremely cheap resource, but we will require a lot of discipline on your side. Like I said, before uh, commit for the full paid course, just always try to try to use the free one. I think we're out of questions. Uh, great questions. Um, uh, thank you, everybody who joined. Uh